page 1, 2, 3, 5. Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was training to be a vicar, there was a a rule. We used to have these meetings where we'd get together, there's a whole, a whole year group, and someone would preach a sermon, and then we'd come in, split up into, into groups and, and discuss the sermon and give feedback and tell the preacher what we thought. And the rule was you have to say something positive before you can say something negative. In fact, you have to say they improved it, three things positive before you say something negative. So sometimes what used to happen was you'd look at the preacher and you'd say, some, people would say something like, I really, really liked your shirt, your jumper and your shoes, but your sermon was terrible. You know, they'd really stick the knife in, you know. Something positive about you, your hair's nice today, but the sermon stank. It was pretty <laughs> gruesome experience, to be honest. Well, Jesus was better than us. When he finds, finds something positive, he says it. He says it to encourage and build up his church. And you see it in the book of Revelation. You see it in the letters we've been studying over the weeks. Letters dictated by Jesus. And where's my clicker? Uh, it's dictated by Jesus to John in Patmos, the island bottom left on the map. And he writes to different churches to say something good and encouraging. So to the first letter, it goes to Ephesus. And Jesus encourages them. He's seen their hard work and their perseverance. And they won't tolerate uh, wickedness. Then the next church, Smyrna, they've been slandered, but they keep going. And they're rich in faith. North to Pergamum, which has remained faithful to Jesus. Even though they're persecuted, they're standing firm in their faith. Thyatira, they, uh, he prays to them for their love and their faith, their service and their perseverance. They keep growing as a church. And today it's Sardis. And what is Jesus positive to say about Sardis? Nothing. Not a thing. Absolutely Nothing. With the other church, he starts off with those positive things way greater than their shirt or their shoes. But this, this church, you see halfway through verse 1, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. The church is dead, or as we'll see, as good as dead. They're they're in their final throes. He, He wouldn't write to a completely dead church, no one would hear. But they're alive enough, but they're on their deathbed. That's their last gasp. Much like the town, the town of Sardis used to be a beautiful, grand city, one of the most famous in the whole world, most important cities, built, here's a picture of the ruins of it today, there was the hill there uh, behind the city, the hills all the way around to protect it from attack. They were very proud of that. Wow, we're protected, we stand secure. But that made them complacent, complacent to the threat of attack. They assumed they were safe. And then the history just before this letter was written, there had been two famous defeats. Soldiers had snuck in overnight, over the mountains, snuck in and defeated the city. And then even more recently, within the last, well, say 50 years, uh, there'd been an earthquake, a big earthquake that had been utterly devastating to the city. So after two big military defeats and an earthquake, the city was a sorry place to live. By the time the letter arrived, it arrives to a faded city. The town was dying. 
but way more serious as far as we're concerned, as far as Jesus is concerned, the church was like the town. The church was dying. But make no mistake, you wouldn't think that if you went there. You wouldn't think it if you saw the church. You wouldn't think Sardis was a dead church, which is, I guess, why Jesus writes to them. He gives them the diagnosis, death, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, the end of verse 1, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Reputation is good of being alive. It would be a church that was known, known around about in the town perhaps as a lively church, a welcoming church, a friendly church, a church with good numbers, with good age range, with good things going on, good singing, lively services. Perhaps it was fun to be there. Perhaps you enjoyed being there. Perhaps there was good teaching. It was well known, so perhaps it was well known in the town. Perhaps even the other seven, six churches that are being written to. Sardis, we know Sardis, it's that church. A flourishing, vibrant, successful church. Everyone sees that, except Jesus. Everyone sees life. Jesus sees death. For every other church, he says good things about them how well they're doing. He encourages them from the positives. But the only good thing he can say here is they have a good reputation and the reputation is not deserved. What a devastating verdict for your Lord and your God to give you that verdict. You are dead. Why? Well, in verse 1, halfway through, Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know what you do. I know the truth. I know what you do do, and I know what you don't do. He said the, other, the same to other churches. To the church in Ephesus, he said, I know your deeds and hard work. To the church in Smyrna, I know your afflictions and poverties. To the church in Thyatira, uh, I know your love and faith. And to that church, he says, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire. We said this last week, he could see into the dark, into the secrets, into any area of life. Jesus can see. He knows the good, the great, and the bad and sinful. He knows our secrets, our lies, our hypocrisy. He knows us intimately, totally intimately. And this church, he knows this church, Sardis, what this church is like. He knows what they do, and what they do shows they're dead. So the church looks alive with its singing songs and clashing tambourines and listening to sermons, hands out for communion, amen to the prayers. But what they do I guess outside the church is what shows it's a sham. They're in church on Sunday, but it doesn't make any difference on Monday. It doesn't change how they live. It doesn't change their deeds. For, he says in verse 2, I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Their deeds are not complete. In other words, nothing is ever finished. They don't care enough to follow through. They say nice things. They have nice sentiments, but they don't do anything. Their good deeds are left undone. What are they not finishing? What do they not do? Well, Jesus doesn't actually say. I guess he doesn't need to say. I guess when he says it, they know full well, gosh, I see what you're saying. He's saying, I know the truth. I see what you do, and I know what you don't do. What else does he need to say? For us, it might be helpful to, for him to say more. Well, let's, can you keep a finger or a notice sheet in there and just turn back a few pages to James, which is on page 1214. James chapter 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> James chapter 2, page 1214. where James is ta- also talks about dead Christians and his challenging words. On page 1214, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? James wants to test what real faith is. What's the point of faith? What is the point of faith if it doesn't lead to deeds, if it doesn't change anything, if it doesn't give you good works? So if someone has real faith in Jesus, living faith, they will do good things. Real faith, he says, produces fruit. Like a tree produces apples, a real Christian produces fruit of changed lives. Real faith in Jesus means that we know our rebellion, 
And we know, therefore, we're forgiven because in Jesus he forgives us. And because we know we've rebelled and now been forgiven, we want to change. Faith in Jesus leads to changed lives, changed priorities, changed actions. And if there is no change, well, James is asking, is there faith at all? If there's no fruit, is the tree alive at all? So verse 14, he says, can such faith save him? If there is faith without any actions, with no fruit, then that's not real faith. That faith is dead, so he can't really be trusting Jesus, so he can't really be saved. But if you have a faith that, that is, makes you different, then you have real faith. The fruit is there, the tree is alive, you're alive, you are, James says, saved. Or in Jesus' words in Revelation, you are alive. And James helpfully offers us a test to see how we would pass. So verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? That's exactly what's happening in Sardis, isn't it? The deeds are not complete. The deeds are left unfinished. There are nice words, there are good aims, But they're not finished, they're not done, they're not followed through. Now that's a challenging thought, isn't it? In what way does James describe you? Good words, nice intentions, but not actually doing anything. It doesn't mean that you don't care, because you do care. You see someone, you care for them. You care enough to feel sad, you empathise with them, but not enough to do anything to help them. It's something Jane and I thought about when we were flooded. I've said this before, but it really struck us. Often people would hear the phrase, if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. And there was no doubt, everybody who said that to us was sincere and meant it. But it could be a mask, couldn't it, that phrase? I care enough to see you in your situation. I care enough to see what a mess you're in and how difficult it is for you. But it might be a mask in saying, I don't care enough to do anything about the situation. So actually, do you see the the, the thing about that phrase, if there's anything I can do, please let me know. The onus comes on the person in need to seek you out and say, I want you to do this for me. So actually, I, I have to put a little bit of pressure on you and say, will you do this for me? Of course you will, but it's, it comes from me, not so much from you, possibly. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Of course it's good meaning. You may have said that and really meant it, absolutely. But it can be a mask to not actually doing anything to help. More helpful is not to say, if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Much more helpful is to say, what can I do? Will you please give me something? What can I do to help you now? And then maybe there's nothing. Well, okay, but there may be, gosh, I really want to help you. What can I do? Actually, you could do this. Then the onus is on you to fulfill and do what you want. It's not on on me to to give you a job to do, but on you to to push me. I want to help you. What can I do? Give me a job. Or just knock on the door as people did. Knock on the door. Here's a meal. Have this. Don't cook. Have this meal. Or have the diary open and say, when can you come around? We'd love to feed you. Life's tough for you today. When could we give you a meal to help you out? We were blessed so much by this church when that happened. But the question is, what does Jesus see in the whole church? And what does Jesus see in you? James' diagnosis is, in verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. Just as in Revelation, here is a dead church. Let's turn back to Revelation 3. Where we read of a church... Which James didn't write to, but he could have done. Could well have written his letter to this church. Might might just as well have done. For their deeds are lacking. Their faith doesn't change them. They're dead. They're not doing what they should. Look at verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. There's a few there who have not given in. Given in to other faiths or joined in wrong practices or rebelled against God in some way. So you have a, there is some, there, okay, there's the positivity in the letter. There's some people who have not failed. Now, we have a reputation as a church, I think. I think we have a good reputation as a church. We have a lot of members. We're quite healthy in that way. And things are, are okay. We have a good age range. We had a lot of children leave this morning. It's, so that's a contrast to many churches today. Many churches have no children or very few. 
But we might be deceiving ourselves. And if we're deceiving ourselves, we're not deceiving Jesus. What does Jesus see when he looks at us now? Are we alive, living, or are we dead? Or is there a mixture? Is your faith alive enough to act or dead? Is your faith challenging you and changing you? Is your life changed because you're a Christian? What, what difference does being a Christian make to you? When it's tomorrow, when you're not here, what difference will it make being a Christian? What difference does it make in your life, not just turning up on Sunday? Yes, that's made a difference because you've got out of bed, you've set the alarm, you've made it here today. But what practical difference does it make for the rest of your life that you're a Christian? Is there life? Or are you dead? Jesus is speaking to Sardis, and the diagnosis for that church is death. And the cure, wake up. Now look, being a Christian is such a joy. The message of Christianity is so liberating to know that we do nothing to rescue ourselves. It is solely by Jesus, him dying in our place, we are rescued. We're forgiven everything, and he just guarantees us an eternity. That is liberating. But it can lead us to sort of, us just thinking, great, I'm, I'm rescued, I'm forgiven, I don't need to contribute anything, and therefore you don't do anything. You, you can just become almost bored with the message, lethargic, then, yeah, I'm forgiven, great, so what? We can hear the challenges and hear the, 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 the pressure on it, not pressure, that's the wrong word, the, the compulsion on us from Jesus to make him Lord and follow him and change our lives, and it can just wash over us. We can say, yeah, there it is, and life carries on. Jesus wants to, us to wake up, shake off the boredom, shake off the apathy, and change. So verse 2, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. To those who think they're alive but are dead, to a church that thinks it's alive and thriving, Jesus shouts to them, wake up! It means they're asleep to the truth. They've got bored of it. They've become apathetic. They've just sort of, their eyes have dulled to it all. And he wants them to realize, you are as good as dead. This is your last gasp. Perhaps their last chance is this letter. Wake up and realize the problem and accept the diagnosis and then do something about it. Here's what you've got to do. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now look, if you're talking about a plant that is fading, you'd water it. If you're talking about an animal gasping on the floor, you'd give it food and drink. If you're talking about faith, then you need to feed it in the same way. Give your faith strength, feed it, and nurture what is remaining. And you do that by, he says, coming to Jesus. Jesus, who he says at the beginning of the letter, holds the spirits and the churches. The spirit that is there that can revitalize the church. The church that he holds in his hand, that is dying in his hand, but he wants it and wills it to come alive. He's urging it to wake up. He's got the resurrection power at his fingertips to give us life. So he gives us three commands. To wake up means, one, to remember, verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Remember the good news. Don't, don't become bored of it and apathetic to it and glazed over to it. Remember that Jesus is Lord. Remember. Wake up yourself to what it means that he died for you, that he rose again for you, that he reigns over you, that he will return for you. This is the truth. And when you forget that, when other things take priority over it, when you realize, remember, remember, and keep, well, the word literally means keep on remembering. Remember that you've, you want him and you've sworn allegiance to him and he is your king. Remember, so obey. Verse 3, remember, therefore, what you've received and heard. Obey it. Do what he says. He is your king. Be loyal to him. Live for him. The, the word means keep on obeying now and keep on obeying for the rest of your life. So when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, stop living for yourself. Start living for other people. Kill off your selfishness and do what your, your emotions tell you. Oh, I'm sorry if you do what he says. Live for others and for him. So, repent. Remember, therefore, verse 3, what you've received and heard. Obey it and repent. So, for what you are not doing, repent. Consciously. Deliberately. Determined, 
determinedly, be determined to renounce, to say no, this drift, this apathy, this glazing over, no, Lord, I am so sorry. Turn back to Jesus. I wonder, when did you last do that? When did you sit and pray and just cry out, oh, Lord, I am so sorry for this, for what I've done. I am so sorry. When have you sat there and remembered the truth that he died to forgive you that? When have you remembered what you've not done, when you've failed him, when you've rebelled against him, but, and cried out forgiveness, determined to change, and you cried out, I've turned away, Lord, I, I turn back now. Remember the truth of his forgiveness. That cry is the fruit of faith. It's the cry of someone who's living, who's strengthening their faith, who's obeying Jesus and making him king once more. If you've not done that, Wake up. Remember. Obey. Repent. Jesus sees and Jesus speaks. The diagnosis is death. The cure is for them to wake up. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he finishes with the consequences. Here's a crossroads. They're about to die. There's a crossroads. They go left or right. Which way they go. Here is the difference it will make. Firstly, a warning to the dead, verse 3. Halfway through verse 3. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I'll come to you. Perhaps that's a, a picture, an illusion, a, a reminder to them of the history of their city. A city which was impregnable. These, this, this fortress hills all the way around, but people snuck in in the night and took the city. Twice. Twice it fell to people who came in the night. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to come to you in the night. You think you're ready, you're apathetic, you're bored, you're glazed over. Like the city, I'll come to you in the night. Now in the Gospels, Jesus says he will come like a thief in the night. And then he's talking about when he'll come to judge the whole world, to return and sort out the mess of the world. But that's not what he's saying here. This, that judgment isn't, isn't a, something that he says, if you do, do this or don't do this, I will come. He's just going to come one day, the day is set. But here, here's a condition. If you do not wake up, he says, verse 3, I will come. So I will come to you. So to this church, to the church in Sardis, if you don't work up, wake up, I am coming to you. It'll be a surprise, like a thief in the night. I will just turn up. And I'm warning you now. I'm giving you advance warning so you can repent. But if you don't, I will turn up and be a surprise. And you'll be judged. And he doesn't say what that judgment will mean, but to the church in Ephesus, he said, in chapter 2, verse six, uh, 5, uh, remember the height from which you've fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. There's the same message, repent, obey, remember. If you do not repent, I will come to you like a thief in the night and remove your lampstand from its place. The, the lampstand is the picture of the church in Revelation. The picture is of these seven churches being written to, like candles burning in a dark night, shining into a dark world. But if the church rebels against Jesus, if the church is dead, then the candle will be snuffed out. The, the flame will be removed. Jesus will take it away. He will judge it. He will snuff out the flame of what's left. That's the warning to the church there um, in Ephesus. It's the warning to the church here in Sardis. And it's actually the warning to all churches because verse 6 says, uh, He who has near, let him hear not what the, the message to, to the church in Sardis, but hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural, the seven churches, and to us and to all Christians and all churches who hear this. To any church where people are dead, to any church where people just go through the motions, to any church where people are not truly living out their faith day by day and hour by hour, if you do not wake up, I will come to you like a thief and you will not know at the time I will come to you. Do you take his warning seriously? If your faith is dead or dying, listen up. Wake up. A promise to the living, verses 4 and 5. Even in the graveyard of this church, there is just the glimmer of life. Those who are awake. And those who will wake up. And those who will now repent. And those who will now respond to the challenge. They will be, well here's the promise, they will be dressed in white. Those who've not drifted are dressed in white. In other words, they're, they're wearing pure 
unsoiled, unmessed up clothing of unmessed up pure lives. So verse 4, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me dressed in white for their, they're worthy, they're pure, they're godly, they're uncontaminated, their lives are not messed up. Not that they're perfect by any means. That's what they walk with me means. They're trusting Jesus. So when they mess up, they come to him straight away. Lord, I've messed up. I need forgiveness. Please forgive me. They remember to obey and they repent when they mess up as they walk with him. But they're dressed in white. And the hope that they have is the hope promised to those who will join them in repenting and obeying and remembering. Verse 5, he who overcomes, those who will remember, obey and repent, will be like them, be dressed in white. They too will be white, dressed and pure, because they too will be walking with their Lord. In Rome in those days, white was reserved for celebration, and particular celebrations. When, a, when an army was returning from a great battle that had won a great victory, people would wear white, the army would wear white, they march through the street, and everyone would cheer and wave and celebrate this triumphal procession. When Jesus returns, we'll be, those who trust him will be dressed in white, celebrating. We're on the winning side, we're on Jesus' side, and here he comes and takes us to be with him dressed in white and named in the book of life verse 5 continues I will never blot out his name from the book of life the, 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 the word name actually appears in this letter uh, uh, four times it appears first it's a bit hidden in our version unfortunately of the Bible but it is there right at the beginning in the word reputation so in verse uh, 1 I know your deeds you have a not reputation it's you have a name of being alive. That's the name. You can see why they translated reputation. Unfortunately, it just hides as a link here in the in the um, in the, the letter. You have a name for yourself, which is a, a false name. By contrast, Jesus is going to look for the true names, because a name in the Bible isn't just your name like Ian. It means something. It, it reveals your character, your qualities, your true identity. So Jesus is coming to look for the names. The true names, to see who are the true Christians, the true believers, who have their, a true Christian name, if you like. Those who have that true name, I will never blot them, out, blot his name from the book of life. The book of life is the life, is the book of those who will be saved, who will live with him forever. Now, there's not, he's not actually saying some people will be swiped from the book of life. Actually, the promise in, Bible, in the Bible is if you're truly saved, if you truly believe, if you repent and believe, you will be in that book of life. And so he's saying, you know, if you're really believing in me and trusting in me, if your life is different, if there is fruit of faith, your name's in that book, it'll never be wiped out. You will never be done away with from the book of life. Your name will not be erased. You will live with me forever, dressed in white. Named in the book of life and named in heaven, the end of verse 5, but will acknowledge, I will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Those who acknowledge, who say, yes, I believe in Jesus and remember to and I repent and believe and let him be king, he will acknowledge them to his Father. So those who say, I I'm, I'm, believe the name of Jesus, I'm with the name of Jesus, then their name will be, Father, these are mine, this name, this person is mine, they love you, they're dressed in white, they're forgiven, let them in. So this is a dead church in Sardis. It's only Jesus who sees it. The reputation is great, but Jesus sees the problem. And he alone can deal with it. And he is ready to. That's why he describes himself right at the beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven stars we're told in Revelation are the seven churches. He holds these churches in his hands. The seven spirits is the spirit given to each church. The spirit that to this church, he's crying out to it, receive my spirit, be revived, come back to life again. Jesus holds the spirit and he holds the church in his hands. If they'll respond. If they'll say yes. He won't force himself, he wants them to respond. He wants them to seek, as dead Christians, the spirit to bring them back to life. He's hovering there, standing there, holding us with the spirit poised for us. If we will respond to him, he has the spirit to revive us in our death, to strengthen our faith, 
to help us remember, to help us obey, to help us repent, to give us life. He's there. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen.